the surest way to kill commercial space transportation is to kill somebody, uh, especially kill a third party. I mean, whether you're killing, you know, killing somebody that's being carried to space is one issue, and carrying, killing a third party is another. And, and where there is no ambiguity on what commercial is, is in the definition of whether you have an FAA license or not. If you have an FAA license, you are a commercial launch. If you don't have an FAA license, you are not a commercial launch. It's binary. Uh, what that tells me is that, that FAA and NASA had better be pretty joined at the hip in this whole process, and, and so I guess I'll probably look to Phil uh, to, to get a sense for how you guys are looking at that process with FAA. Is who's going to license what? Who's going to set the safety standards? And, and, and I would like you to, to go through the distinction between taxi and rental car, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Yeah. Can I skip to the second one? That's sure. easier. No, no, no. Well, I'll then, you, then I'm going to bring you back to the first. Yeah, right, right. Uh, did Brett give, you, Brett give you that question? Because he's like, I really want to know what you guys are doing with the FAA. Um, what I can say, what we're doing today is we have a partnership with the FAA to exchange information and ex exchange personnel. Uh, there's somebody from the commercial crew office that's uh, headed up in KSC up here in DC and is embedded into Ken's organization. We have an individual from Ken's organization down at KSC, where, so we're exchanging a lot of information. Uh, there is visibility and transparency into our process. Uh, one of Ken's uh, people have been involved in almost all of our major reviews, uh, part of our requirements development process. We are also have some visibility and transparency into their development of regulations and regs. So there's a lot of that going on, a lot of exchange of information. Uh, the big question is, uh, when are we going to license our, are we going to license our launches and when? And uh, I can't tell you that. <laughs> We're still working that out, uh, exactly when. I can say that well, it's going to be before your launch, if yeah, you do. Yeah, we'll get there before then. I can say that there is a consensus that the eventual state is that we will turn all of this over to the FAA to regulate crew and passenger safety. Uh, we will maintain some aspects that we have to do because these are our people, uh, but we do not want to be regulators. There's already a regulator. Uh, they have the statutory, statutory authority to do that, and eventually, we certainly don't want to do, duplicate that, um, but right now, the fact is the standards and requirements and the processes to do safe human spaceflight exist at NASA. So we have to um, go through a process of transferring that to the FAA, not too fast, not too slow, and we're trying to figure out the right time frame. So uh, I sort of punted on that. But it, it, I can say that there is an acknowledgement within NASA that the eventual state is that we turn that over to the FAA. And before you get to your taxi versus yeah, rental car thing, uh, let me say, yeah, the organizations are working very, very well together, I think. They're, we're always looking for ways to improve um, and do more. So and I were just working together very closely on a report that's going to be coming out very soon. Uh, we're, we're absolutely working together. The regs are the regs, and what a, con what, a, what a customer puts in their contract with a supplier is another thing. And so if NASA's a customer, and they, they can write anything in there they want. They can say, paint the capsule pink, and you know, make sure you've got you know, red bows on the ribbon, on the switches. It doesn't matter what they want, as long as the regs, as long as the regs and their requirements don't conflict, right? And so we're, we're making sure that things don't conflict. Uh, I think overall, like Phil said, we've got a lot of people working together. Um, we're looking into each other's, you know, making sure we understand each other's operations. I was NASA for 20 years practically. I'm at FAA now. George Neal, who's NASA, who work, you know, admin, associate administrator of FAA. Jim Banlack, deputy associate administrator, is ex NASA. So we've got a ton of NASA folks in FAA. Those people who. who got a reputation within NASA, let's say. They know NASA, they understand it. Um, whether they were they ran out or ran you know, ran away or you know were pulled out or whatever. <laughs> you know, who knows what, why they came. But we understand each other I think very well and, and we absolutely understand each other's perspectives. I think there's a real impetus and there's a real you know soul searching going on within NASA right now as as they, as they should as to what is the right level of insight and oversight. You know and Understanding that the president is telling us that economic development is a very important aspect of everything we do in the government, and you know NASA has to look at ways that they're going to be able to make you know make decisions that will help the economy in the long run. And so I think that's going to be another thing that they have to look at. I'm sure Brett wants to take the to chastise me on this. So I should grab the mic. 
You're still going to come back to taxis and rental cars. I'll, yeah, right. Stall. I'll be brief. Um, I, I have a different opinion from, from both Phil and Ken. Uh, I don't think they're, I think they're working collegially together, but I think the, that NASA fundamentally is going through a choice, uh, and I'm not sure where they'll come out, which is this is our mission, you know, hands off. Uh, versus uh, we can work with the FAA and not have overlapping uh, uh, authorities. And I think some folks within NASA just view that as uh, giving too much ground to the FAA and saying, if we're going to protect our astronauts, we're going to be the only ones involved in that process. Uh, as opposed to saying, we understand the FAA's role is different uh, and, and they're not overlapping and complementary and, and moving forward with that decision. I don't think that that decision is a hard one. I think it, it may be more complicated to, to ensure that there is no overlap. But I think the decision is an easy one. And I think it's an easy one for the sole purpose of, if the purpose of the program is to uh, have a, a, a capability that can be sold uh, or can be used commercially as well as for those government missions, then the, the minimizing the business risk, minimizing the technical risk, uh, minimizing the regulatory risk for industry uh, is, is, a, is a high goal. And, and minimizing the risk means you have the same process and procedures no matter who's sitting on top of the rocket. And if NASA doesn't have the FAA involved uh, and they, you know, a, a company flies on Tuesday for NASA, flies on Wednesday, uh, in a commercial mode and now has to deal with entirely different folks that do safety oversight, uh, that is a problem. Even if they have the same process and rules, you're dealing with different people, they're all going to want to look at, well, how did it function yesterday? Well, we weren't there, we don't know. And so there, it automatically injects risk uh, into the system to have different uh, regulatory regimes. So I think it's an easy decision and, and NASA should make it. NASA should make the decision to do it, yeah. Okay. Um, so Bob's second part of his question was rack, uh, rental car versus taxi. And what he's referring to is um, when we eventually get to purchasing services to the International Space Station, will it be more like a rental car where we sort of take ownership of the vehicle for a period of time? Um, or do we just buy seats? And the crew offices come out with a memo saying they prefer a rental car uh, model. I'm shocked. Yeah, right. But in the rental car model, doesn't the rental car company write the contract? You just sign it and take possession, right? That is true. Yeah, there's all, you know, that, not into getting into the contractual situation. It's really just that simple whether we're going we're gonna to retain a little bit more um, ownership's not the right word. Uh, Operator, operating a responsibility for the vehicle um, as opposed to the other model, which is uh, a taxi model where you don't have any responsibility for that whatsoever. My personal feeling is I don't understand why everybody's so excited about that. Um, I don't even know why it's so important that, that, uh, that we would even ask that question. From my perspective, we are trying, we want to acquire safe, reliable, and cost-effective transportation to the ISS for our astronauts. That's it. It's that simple. If somebody comes forward with a taxi model that is safer, more reliable, and more cost effective than somebody in a rental car, I'm going to pick the taxi model. Same thing reverse. If someone comes with a safer, more reliable, more cost effective uh, system that is rental car, and another one's got a taxi that's more expensive, less reliable, less safe, I'm going to pick the rental car. I really don't care. And I want to make sure that NASA does not dictate that answer because I think ultimately it is not relevant. So while I agree with the astronaut office or with others, not just the astronaut office, other people feel like that too. While I agree that there are some operational advantages to having a rental car model, it is completely inconsistent with the philosophy of the program to enable and allow the commercial provider the flexibility to design their system that makes their business sense and closes their business case. So I do not want to dictate one or the other. Um, we're going to try hard not to do that um, as much as possible. 
And I think that goes also, I, I was quoted in the press by saying that that also applies to aspects of crew safety. We want a safe vehicle and we are going to require a certain level of safety. How they get to that level of safety, we want to try and leave that trade space open as much as possible to the commercial providers. Uh, and another um, area where a lot of NASA people feel very strongly about that is in the area of spacesuits. I see that as an implementation. Uh, I want to leave that trade space open to the commercial providers and not dictate it. A lot of, NASA has a lot of experience, a lot of hard earned, um, tough experience that people say well, you got to have spacesuits. I recognize that, but I also recognize that it is not our place to dictate that or not. Um, so we're going through that debate. We'll see. Right now, our requirements say protect for a rapid depressurization in the capsule. That is ultimately what we're trying to get to. And we're going to leave that trade space open. It may be that all the providers come back with a, with a design that has spacesuits. Maybe not. We'll see. But in terms of philosophically for the program, what should we be doing? That is pretty clear. We should not be dictating design considerations. We should be standing our, our, setting our safety standards. Um, and requirements and then allowing the providers to meet those the best way they see fit. You know, I, I hear you and, and I guess philosophically I understand, but if I'm the builder of, of something that you're going to go either rent or, or hire me to take you, um, how I build that, how I adapt that for the crew, how I build the training systems for the crew are going to be very, very different whether I can use two of my own people every time or it's going to be a different NASA astronaut in command every time it goes to station. Um, and so I, I guess I understand, but, but I, I think the industry side would be very different than what you, what you suggested. It's an integral consideration. No question that it is an integral consideration. The question is who makes that decision, whether they want to have their personnel as the two commanders and a certain number of passengers or if they want to use a NASA astronaut as a commander and all NASA people in, during the mission. I'm going to leave that. Oh, I, I would almost be willing to bet that the companies want to have their own guy doing it. It's cheaper that way. I mean, very it, it gets complicated when you look at the concept of operations now that you have to go and leave that. We want it to be. Well, a crew if you want, if you want to be a crew return vehicle, then it's a different it's problem. A different You're story. right. Yeah, sure. It gets complicated. Yeah. So. Brent, any thoughts on that? Uh, just thinking on that one one piece that if if there's seven seats in it, you 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 know you can sell all seven of them to NASA, then it's not cheaper to, to have your own people flying it because NASA will pay for the privilege of flying it. And so, you know, from a business consideration, there's there's ups and downs to it. Um, but uh, I wanted I wanted to uh, switch a little bit and, and just say. You know, if, if my last response was uh, the chastising part of the uh, of the session, then this is the the kissing up part of the session. Um, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, and wait a minute. Wait, would somebody check his ID card? Make sure he's really. Time, Bob. Oh, okay. Time. Yeah, it'll come around. Oh, gee, look at time. No, okay. Um, but if it, what Phil just said about leaving the development approach up to the companies and and leaving the decisions to them. Uh, that, that's absolutely right. Agree with that 100%. I think Phil started this program with that mindset. I don't think all of his colleagues uh, on, on his team started the program with that mindset. Uh, and I think uh, they have come a, a tremendous way in the last year since a lot of them learned of the, of the creation of the program sort of on, on February 1st last year. Uh, and the NASA side of things uh, May, may not be there yet, in, in my view, but they've come a long way. And the program that they're talking about now in CCDEV2 and CCDEV1 as well, it is fundamentally different from a traditional NASA uh, procurement type activity, and development activity, uh, and, and, and in many, many positive ways. Uh, and they've got a little bit ways to go. They have some, you know, some things that I would disagree with, but on, on a whole, uh, they've come a long way, and, and uh, it, it's really uh, working working well. So, go ahead, Anybody Ken. else that want to take this up, Mark? I haven't given my speech yet. Yeah, well, I know. But, and I've got, an, I've got a question related to this one that you can either give as part of your speech or sitting in your chair. Why don't I see if uh, we answer it for you, sir? How's that? As we go, as, as I go through this. Okay. Real quick. It's like he wants to pose. How's that? <laughs> so I can't pose my question to you? Sir, you are a general and I am a colonel. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> okay. I, I, will, I will allow you to again say, I'm going to say that, but you're next so you can just go right into it. The, the, I, I will overstate it. It, it, it. When something launches from a 
launch base either on the west coast or the east coast for NASA, for commercial, or for, for the Air Force. After everybody gets done saying the rocket's healthy, the payload's healthy, everybody's ready to go, the last person that gets to vote is wearing a blue suit. So what's your role in this safety issue, license issue, dealing with this issue? Well, that, that, that's, uh, that's a great question, sir, because as you know, the, the commander, and having been the commander at the Cape, your responsibility, your primary responsibility is public safety. Right, so you give that final go that that rocket is not going to go and you know land on Orlando and kill 5,000 people. That's that is the responsibility of what we call the, the Space Launch Commander, uh, the Launch Decision Authority, uh, gives that final go. Now, the Launch Decision Authority never goes without the rocket guy saying I'm good or the satellite guy or the yeah, you, know, you uh, never overrule it. good, but uh, the range has to have the ability to protect public safety at all times. And you know, this is a dichotomy that we're going to talk a little bit about uh, during the speech is that we must have this very, very high standard for public safety, yet we want to have these new commercial entrants come in and give stuff a shot to some extent, right? So how do you, how do you protect that, that safety aspect? Uh, it, but it really changes your risk calculus. So if I can get to sounds like you want to come up here. In a little You're bit. on. Well, I, I, I like Ken's idea of uh, of sitting down and promotes this banter, and I want to first commend uh, my fellow fellow panelists on their anti PowerPoint stance. I think that is uh, fantastic. <laughs> and the audience uh, so certainly appreciates that. Um, second, it, it's kind of humbling to be a rocket scientist and be the dumbest guy in the room. Uh, and. Uh, uh, finally, I want to correct something that Dr. Squire said this morning. Uh, he, he said that uh, launch guys are optimists, uh, but really we're paranoid schizophrenics. <laughs> if you think about the job that you, the satellite builders and the scientists are asking to do, so you spend years and years on this little baby, right, and it's got a billion dollars worth of scientific instrumentation. You've invested your whole life. It's like that kid, you know, with the $500 we're going to give him in his garage, and he's going to do it for the rest of his life, right? So he is so devoted to this. We spend time and energy, and that risk profile is just kind of creeping along as I go through the requirements stage of this whole thing. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to take this thing with its little hinges and its, and its you know, very pristine mirrors that, you know, if I wear deodorant inside the clean room, I screw the whole thing up. You know, it's, it is a very, very intricate and delicate system. And then I'm going to take it, I'm going to put it on top of a controlled explosion and shake and bake and rattle and roll it and throw it literally into space. It, you know, it, it takes a certain mentality to be able to uh, reconcile those two worlds. And uh, the whole commercial launch thing is, is very different because we have this safety mindset. We have this thing called 100% mission success. Everybody is very focused, 100% mission success. Everybody likes to talk about the streak. Is there a streak? Right? So the, the rocket on the pad has no memory of the success of its predecessors. So it's one in a row every single time. Right? So I, I, you know, I, it's nice to think about your successes in the past, but it's, it's another thing to do it. And I remember in 1992, I wrote a paper for this guy, Colonel Bob Dickman. Uh, when he was at the, at, on the air staff in uh, the Directorate of, of Space Acquisition, and I was a student at the Air Force Institute of Technology, and uh, he, he challenged me to go out and examine the difference between commercial launch and, and public space launch, you know, the government-funded space launch. And, and basically the conclusion of the paper, and, and basically based on what you said, sir, was, uh, you know, if we keep doing it this way, the U.S. is going to be out of business in commercial space launch. And, and boy, was that prescient. Were you right? Uh, because we were, had probably, what, 80-ish percent of the market in the late 80s, early 90s. And now, if you take a look, uh, we have a very small percentage of that market. So uh, what do we do to bring that back? Well, the, the first thing uh, that, that we do, and we talked about that risk calculus, is uh, everybody asks, well, what the, what the heck is a launch group? You have a launch group commander. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the NASA side, everything manned goes out of 39, everything unmanned goes off of Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. So I'm the, I'm the guy who's responsible for making sure that Cape Canaveral Air Force Station does its thing. And one of the things that we do on every single rocket, regardless of its commercial or if it's a government rocket, is a thing we call mission assurance. And does, does anybody know what mission assurance is? I know we don't do it. <laughs> 
Everybody's always proving this negative. I don't know. Well, well Mr. NASA, what's what's mission assurance? Don't put me on the spot. Come Go on. ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. We do it a lot. We do it in spades. We care about it a ton. Yeah. Uh, we spend a lot of time, a lot of resources on mission assurance, and it's something that we take very seriously. I don't know exactly what mission assurance is, to be honest. I, I know that it's everything that it takes to make the mission successful. And uh, again, we, we launch guys that are kind of the studs of, of, of the base, you know, we're the ones with the fire and the flame <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But really, it's not, it's not about the rocket. It, it's about that thing sitting on top that is used not to, I know, it's hard to believe, the not blur the launch <laughs> bases. It's not ballast, contrary to popular uh, opinion at the launch bases. Uh, you know, it would be a whole heck of a lot easier if we just didn't launch satellites, we just launched rockets for the fun of it. Uh, but that, that, that ain't how it works. So, uh, yeah, 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 you wouldn't make a whole lot of money that way. So we do this thing called mission assurance. And this, this thing called mission assurance, everything that it takes to make a, make the mission successful. So uh, that's a very different definition if you're a commercial guy versus a government guy. If you're a, com if you're a government guy and a cost plus, we love you, baby, because the more I talk to you, the more Tims I have, the more I charge the government, right? It, but it's a model that seems to work, right? And if you look at the broad area review that happened after the series of launch failures in the late 1990s, so we, we have to put the technical rigor uh, back on the government side. And that's what my organization is, is that technical rigor that goes in and does that insight and oversight task that looks at the 300 plus different processing steps that go into getting a rocket ready to launch and try to understand that. And, and our partners at ULA are fantastic. They, they give us full and open insight. They're willing to work with us. And, and you can see, based on that streak thing, that, uh, that it seems to be working. Now, if I take that same paradigm of insight and oversight and try to apply that to a SpaceX, for example, I, I could crush them with my government love. And that is not, I, I don't think that's the right thing to do. So it, it's going to be a very delicate balance. And then when I want to put a human on top of it, man, uh, you know, the, I look at the space shuttle, which has been a great system, and I look at the level of insight and oversight that NASA has on the space shuttle at, at kind of one end of, of, the, of the continuum. Then I look um, at, at, you know, kind of uh, Wallops Island or um, Kwajalein when SpaceX went down there with no insider oversight. So I got to figure out where we are on this continuum, understanding that for me as a range guy, my primary role is public safety. So I got to keep all that in mind, and I want that that elusive thing called 100% mission success. So with that, I will allow you to crucify me now, sir. <laughs> okay, I, I, I am going to put you on the spot uh, one little bit, and, and that is the, you know, the the quip in the industry was, why would anybody go to Wallops to launch? And the answer was, it's not the Cape. Um, and, and it's because it was, because it was just so damn hard to get through our processes to, to get off the ground. What's happened to make that better? I mean, has Elon beat you guys to death, or, or well, is that where you want to go? If you want to play in Peoria, or you want to play on Broadway, you know, no, I'm <laughs> that was kind of the, uh, that was, that, no, that, that, was, uh, that was the old way of thinking. Let me just get that out there. That was the old way of thinking. The new way of thinking is, holy crap, they can compete with us. We got to do something different. And I got to tell you, uh, God bless SpaceX, they have made the U.S. government better. They have pushed us to look at our processes. Uh, it, it, just one example, you know, the government does everything in paper and need everything in triplicate, right? So they come with these CAD drawings of, uh, of their flight safety systems and they want us to evaluate them like, uh, we don't have the software, it's going to take six years for us. <laughs> uh -uh. Right? They also sit in a room and they go, why are there 30 government guys here and I got two, two SpaceX guys here? How much is that guy charging me? What's that guy doing? Why is he here? You know, so that transparency is very different as well. I, I don't know where the heck I'm going with this, but... <laughs> Well, but, but why would I was going to say, let me save you, the, the concept that SpaceX has made the government better, 
I think XCOR is making the private industry better as well, government better, with this new contract that uh, um, they signed for their hydrogen oxygen engine that they're going to be mm -hmm. doing. Um, I think SpaceX is also making EADS um, EADS better. Um, I was talking with somebody last week and they were saying how they're looking internally. They're saying, holy cow, SpaceX is able to build this rocket and do it really cheap and we need to figure out how to do that as well. So they're, for, they're raising the bar, believe it or not, at lower cost. And, if, and hopefully people step up. Well, if you, if you look at how long it took them to go from, we, we ripped down the pad, and then 20 months later, they launched. But the old Titan pad at, at Pad 30. Yeah. And 20 months later, that, I mean, a government program, how long did it take us to go when we started building Pad 39 uh, to the time we launched was... Well, when we, tried, when we rebuilt 40 or 41 to do Titan 4, so or when we blew up Titan... a little bit longer, Titan but we had the government complex system. Four imposed upon them, right? So can you be more agile? Can you be more flexible? Yeah, and now the government is forced to be that, and I think that's a good thing. But, you know, again, with maintaining that very high level of public safety. Okay, let, let me do a, a, a really simplistic and then see if this works. The, the, the range guy, is he's, re, he's responsible or she's responsible for third-party safety. If it's a commercial launch, and for the safety of the launch pad so you don't blow the rocket up and destroy the government property, but has no responsibility for a commercial launch, whether or not the rocket works, whether the payload works, or anything like that. FAA is the same until you put a human being on top, in which case, probably, if it's like FAA for airplanes, like FAA. which we don't know yet, but maybe, then it, it has some role. And it, it seems like you've already stepped into that for the suborbital stuff. Currently, we care about the human as long as they're part of the safety system on the vehicle. After that, it's debatable. What well, but, but it wasn't your rule put in place that allowed the suborbital stuff to happen as an experiment? I and mean, that was an FAA determination that that was okay. Yeah, but the, the, the law, which is the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act of 2004, prohibits the FAA from having regulations for the passenger safety uh, well, through the end of 2012. Somebody's going to have to do that because it's not, it's, we're not worried about right. NASA so commercial NASA. crew. We're worried about the guy f flying out of Mojave or out of out of we're New Mexico. Do, we're not obliged to do that part of it to allow the industry to mature and to develop. But, yeah, until well, no. Well, I'll be I'll be December twenty fourth, twenty twelve. Ignorant and say if not you, who? Well, there's got to be somebody. So somebody will protect. So the, yeah, yeah, it'll be. So if I come further down the table. Phil, you're going to be worried, NASA's going to be worried about the entire stack and whether those people get there safely and do their thing right if it's a NASA launch. So that's an oversight insight. How do you play that whole thing? Right. That's a great question, uh, Bob. And we will be uh, intensely interested in that entire mission phase because uh, our people are on and in part of that uh, entire mission phase. So this term, insight oversight, this phrase, we've used that a lot. So for those of you that are not interest or up to speed on that. Insight is our ability to discern the true nature of the system and the oversight is sort of government direction where we tell them what to do. So the difference that we are trying to accomplish within commercial crew is historically we have had continuous oversight. We had in a, in a traditional human spaceflight program we've had discrete insight we would come together for this big review, we'd have stacks and stacks of paper, we'd have our contractors go through and we'd write RIDs and then we'd go back to our place. So we would have these discrete insight models or insight events and then continuous oversight. When we were on a continuously basis telling the contractor what to do, giving them direction, seeing design, saying, oh, I don't like that, do it this way, do it this other way. That turned out to be kind of costly because you had a lot of changes on an ongoing basis and it was hard to get a baseline design. We're flipping the model for commercial crew. We want continuous insight with discrete oversight. We believe that that will be more effective, more penetrating, and more cost effective um, in us understanding the true nature of the system, but much more cost effective because we're not in this continuous direction mode. We have limited ability. We're not going to be telling them what to do every day. We wanna, we're going to have discrete events where we can say, yes, you have met this chunk of requirements then that's not going to happen again until the next event. So we strongly believe that that has the ability to change the equation on spaceflight development, and I believe that's one of the reasons why SpaceX was successful um, under the COTS program, but it wasn't just us. They did a lot of their, their own things. Um, but that is one of the unique 
paradigm changes that we're trying to accomplish with commercial crew and we believe that it will be not only as effective but potentially more effective in allowing us to gain the true nature of the system while still ensuring the mission assurance that we are very concerned about at the end of the day. Not, not, not to keep going back to the old home week with EELB, but I've just got to tell you, what NASA's doing now, if we didn't have the stove pipes in place, might have actually happened earlier. Because back in the EELB days, as you might recall, we had some second lieutenants in just about every IPT yep. who sat in on all the meetings, had no ability to tell us to do anything, but could take good notes and ask good questions. And then periodically, they'd have a PDR and whatever else, you know, CDR, whatever else. They'd have a, a, a team, a limited team, a few dozen people from aerospace and from uh, SMC and whatnot and Space Command. And, and those people would really dig in. And so it's a very similar model. And guess what? Look at you remember the score sheet for the ELBs? Not a single failure. So I, that, that model can work. I think you guys are going to have good success, success with it. Yeah, the, uh, the government actually went through a, a very, very rigorous process on EELV to figure out how out of one program office you would conduct that with two competing, because there in the early days the assumption was that either Boeing or Lockheed would continue on and one of them wouldn't. And so it was a, it was a constant competition for years. And then for the SPO to be able to do that was a challenge and, and it was kind of good on them for being able to. You want well, to say yeah, something? We still do uh, you know, a pedigree sure. review on every oh. major component yeah. you know, where we go back and look at the paper on everything. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, but we're more we're into that continuous oversight yeah, so than we were yeah, before. The, the government has this voracious appetite for data, yeah. and, and, and that, that uh, insight quickly. Uh, okay, I'm going to make one more observation and then open the question, the, the questions, the floor to questions, questions to the floor, whichever that is. Uh, I, I've known Lee for a, a long time, and, and I have never seen his integrity light flicker red. So I know he was being honest in what he says about SpaceX, but I will also tell you that, that it's, it's a great loss to the Air Force and, and the government that he is retiring in another month and a half or so, uh, and, and he's going to go work for SpaceX and build their launch pad at Vandenberg. So, <laughs> uh, and and. And it's sort of a tribute to SpaceX that they hire people that are just that damn good. Good on you, man. Thank you, sir. Questions from the floor? Uh, we'll start to find it. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of interested in this whole uh, issue of who decides when it's okay to launch because of public safety. And over the years, I've thought about uh, Virgin Galactic and these kind of... So the scenario would be, I want to launch a celebutant into the sky and make her happy and all that, right, get the money. But we don't want her crashing into city on the way down, right? So <laughs> it, when this starts really happening, who's going to decide when it's safe for those guys to launch that system? I mean, the pilot's probably responsible to know a crash landing or something, or emergency, they, the pilot can do that, but. For the specific instance that you're providing, which is Virgin Galactic launching a member of the public, you know, a paying member of the public, that's a commercial system. It's regulated by the FAA, Office of Commercial Space Transportation. We'll give them a, a usable mission license, and that means they can fly this mission profile good for a certain amount of time. They can be renewed. The, we check the technical aspects of the flight. You know, we do all the safety calculations, E sub C, all that sort of stuff, and you make the determination. They get the license. They can fly. Well, who says it's safe to launch on that day? Push the button. And Virgin Galactic. Virgin Galactic gets to make the decision on every specific one. And we're talking, remember, they're building five, they're going to build five ships for the initial fleet. If one flies once a week, or if they fly once a week, they get five flights a week with one, um, with one ship, they could have 300 flights in a given year, given the customer. So they're going to be flying quite a bit. And hopefully, what you want to see with these low-performing vehicles, these are not high, these aren't Ferraris, right? These are Volkswagens. You want to see operational efficiencies. You want to see turnaround time. You want to see experience build up. They're going to get very good at this. They're going to know their system. They're going to know, you know, how well it's performing and when to take a double look at something. You know, uh, the tires need changing. If, if, if you look at it in terms of general aviation, you know, the pilot decides when he's going to fly. As long as he's got a license and as long as the, the tower at the local area says, you know, you're deconflicted with public safety and other planets. So it's, it's up to the... And, and as long as your airplane is certified. Right, right. Now, I, I would assert that, that it's going to be a very different issue whether or not the vehicle is controllable in its route to space. If it's a rocket without wings, uh, it's going to be handled much more 
strictly than if it's got wings and a pilot can bring it down safely if the if the engine fails or whatever. If, and, and that's why I think inland licensing for expendable launches is going to be a long way yeah. to, before it happens. Uh, having, as, as Lee said, I, I sat in that chair for a long time and uh, y you just don't want things intentionally flying over people and hoping they work. Yeah, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I read that, let's well, see, the Russians were charging about $20 million for a tourist to go into space and, and that included training. And I read recently that NASA will be paying about $65 million for a launch. And I don't think that includes training for the astronauts. And, and can you comment on the, what that says about what the commercial market might be expecting <laughs> on NASA's negotiation abilities when it comes to paying for launches? Uh, so, so, Ken, what do you think the going rate is for a tourist today? Because he's quoting a, a price that was probably, it's probably 10 years ago. Yeah, it's, it's probably more. I mean, granted, that price was what the, what the word on the street is that in the contract that Tito originally paid was, he, there was a clause in the contract that said, you will say it cost $20 million, even though it didn't really cost that. So he probably paid a little bit less than that, or quite a bit less than that. But I, what, isn't it like $30 million, he says? 35. 35. So 35. Uh, I can say that NASA procures more than just the seat. Uh, we do include training. Um, we do in also include the ability to come down. So we're paying for the rescue uh, capability, which is not part of the tourist uh, uh, mission. And we are also paying for um, a certain amount of down mass. So it's not just the seat. We are actually procuring more services than a tourist would. Uh, I would also say when you talk about the negotiation uh, the negotiation ability of NASA. Um, when the shuttle retires, we will have no ability in the U.S. to get our people to the International Space Station. That puts us at a fundamentally different negotiating posture than a tourist. A tourist can take his or her money and do something else with it. We don't necessarily have that same luxury at NASA, and both sides of the table know that. So it's a fundamentally different negotiation, I believe, than you would see from between a tourist and an operator. So I don't, I don't think it's necessarily fair uh, to characterize us as just poor negotiators. It's just uh, there's a different leverage system there, and we are procuring more than the seat. There's definitely more content in our contract with the Russians uh, than a tourist is going to purchase. Although surely the tourist purchases the right to come down, too. No, 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 no. Yes, but the, no. That was a joke. That was a joke. It's a rescue service, no. you know, with yeah, the that was a joke, Phil. Okay, thank you. So, this year, everyone got it. Yeah. It's a joke. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to beat NASA up because they have to buy from the Russians in order to maintain access to the space station. Uh, but it highlights the need to get on with the commercial crew program, to increase the funding over the levels that were in the authorization bill, more along the lines of what was proposed by the president. Uh, and it need, you know, the, the more money, the more money is also going to be matched by the private sector, the more jobs are going to be created, the faster we're going to be able to do it, the faster we close that gap, the faster we stop creating jobs in Russia and we create them here. So it, it, this is now a question for Congress, and Congress needs to get on with it as well. I'll just go back to my historical thing again, which is if you go back to the how the airlines got created in this country, which is kind of an interesting thing, the Postal Service decided back in the 1920s that it would be a good idea to help foster the development of commercial air transportation. And so they paid more per pound for airplanes that were able to carry people meeting certain safety requirements than if you flew an airplane with just mail by itself. It was a con conscious decision by the government at the time to try to develop a, a human air transportation system by being a good anchor tenant. And so if NASA's paying a little bit more, hey, that's worked pretty well in the past in, in similar models, so. But they're paying more to the Russians. No, we no, 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 I'm talking about, if no, I'm saying if they're paying more for the commercial crew guys to bring astronauts up and down to the station instead of what they would get if they went to the Russians. It's not just, not just the cheapest way to get the crew there, so is there a societal way? No, way, way, way back when, in the 1860s, the government decided to do a transcontinental railroad, and it, it changed that transportation paradigm. And in the 1920s, the government decided that basically it was going to invest in an air, air infrastructure through the Postal Service, and it changed that paradigm. The Commercial Space Launch Act 
put in place the process to do that in this country. We just haven't embraced that it's a government, it's a government role to move us into that infrastructure so that the commercial guys can in fact grow for, in ways that we can't even conceive today. In the back. I'd, I'd appreciate your comments. Uh, you're talking in, in this discussion is about sending human beings into space, which obviously it is, which is very important. Uh, sending tourists into space, sending scientists into space. But in this discussion, ultimately, it's sending astronauts into space. I'd be curious in your comments about uh, any unique dynamic that you see that creates in terms of the public, in terms of political uh, implications. Uh, killing, tourists are killed going up the top of Mount Everest. I and mean, I think people generally view that as, it's your money, it's your, have at it. But, but astronauts, I think the public, uh, in the political process we've seen in the past holds in a very different light. So I'd be curious about your comments about how that can be dealt with. Well, I'll make a comment because I, I think we've got it exactly backwards if we think that we should worry more about a protecting an astronaut than a, a civilian that's going to space. And, and there was a guy that, that spoke, uh, he was an astronaut, and, and I won't say his name, but he spoke earlier today, um, that actually in our magazine, uh, and I'll paraphrase, but basically said the commercial transportation is a good thing and, and we should let the commercial guys try it long enough to be proven out, and once it's proven out with tourists, then we'll put astronauts on it. And I'm saying to myself, what's wrong with this picture? You know, tell that to Alan Shepard or Neil Armstrong? It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, Anybody? let grandma go first, and then the astronauts will go. But yeah. That's what we're yeah. But you had, I wanted to mention this before in my comments, because you introduced, when you talked, when you said, now Ken, your turn, the thing you said was, well, we all know that the first, the thing that will kill the industry is when we, when somebody, you know, gets killed in a commercial space flight. And I don't agree with that. Well, it'll certainly make things kill. harder for a while. It, will, it might make things harder for a while, but I just don't agree with that. And I think that's, again, that's kind of a, it, it highlights the fact that this isn't a rational market. There's a, there's a lot of emotion associated with what we're going on. The future is not going to be indicated by what's been happening, what's happened in the past. When there's a lot of taxpayers' dollars on the line and you're flying this half a billion dollar vehicle, you know, the operations, everything's a half a billion dollars every time you fly and um, they have a bad day, things need to stop, you need to figure out what's going on, especially if it is, again, a Ferrari. But, I mean, if you're into routine operations, you're in, you know, somewhere down the line in terms of routine operations and you've developed some standard procedures, yes, there's going to be a something in there that comes out one day and bites you that you didn't expect and you haven't seen it before and, oh my God, what happened? People are going to slow down for a second, figure out what went wrong, and they're going to figure out what went wrong and they're going to fix it. And SpaceX has done a great job in doing that, granted with unmanned vehicles, look at their first Falcon 1 flight, you know, and they, they figured out what went wrong and they fixed the, that was the loose, the corroded bolt. When they had the problem with the corkscrewing of these, um, the second flight, they figured out what went wrong there. The third flight was the one where the, the, second, the first stage came back and hit the second stage in the butt. They figured out what went wrong there. So they've, they've shown that they can do a quick turnaround. And if I'm not mistaken, they, they made those corrections very quickly, especially with respect or in relation to government timescales. Yeah, I would, I would totally concur with what Ken said. We have to change the way we are doing things in order for this to work. Um, the past is not an indicator of the future. Do we want routine access to space or not? That is the question. If we don't want routine access to space, let's keep doing this, you know, multi-billion dollar thing where the astronauts are these super, super precious things, which they are, um, and when we have a bad day, we have a presidential commission and everything stuff. Uh, if we want that, future, then let's just keep doing that and keep asking those questions. We don't want that future. We want a different future where we have routine access to space. Things are going to have to change. Our understanding is going to have to change. Our expectations are going to have to change. And by the way, every year there are fatalities in every mode of transportation in existence. Six to seven hundred people die in bicycle crashes every year. Why, Every, pedest why pedestrians in the District of Columbia are not forced to wear helmets because about 100 people a die in the District of Columbia every year. When, right. You know, Every year. mode of transportation every year has fatalities <laughs> and we shouldn't expect space flight to be any different. 
I, I, I don't see how we could expect spaceflight to be any different. The only way we could is by grounding everybody and never fly. And I don't know, I don't think that's an acceptable future. Maybe I'm gonna, I wanna look at Lee, but and before I get to you, one of the things that happened, in, I think it was the second Falcon 9 flight, and, and if anybody in this room would have predicted that they were gonna land within half a mile of their target in the Pacific Ocean, you're lying. I mean, that was an incredibly successful process. But what I think didn't get seen by a lot of people, they got down to their countdown to about T0, scrubbed, and came back in the same window and launched, or the same day and launched. If, if there was no government system that would have launched within a week. It, it's more like a software company, right? And it's kind of got that, um, that IT feel to it. Um, you know, it, the, the way we do business today is very much by analysis, hard analysis, with some test thrown in there, but boy, we, we, you know, would the government allow you to get inside the second or uh, interstage of a rocket the night before, cut, you know, 18 inches off the second stage nozzle and say, giddy up, let's go. Um, boy, we, if, if that Sir. was us, we would have directed on what the stage was. All right, stop. <laughs> Thanks. I, I have a question, but Bob, um, uh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, no, one for the you. moderator on the spot. Um, I like that. Put you on the spot. Did you have Athena in there? I counted 16. Oh, <laughs> did I have a Athena? Athena? I counted Athena rocket. Uh, Athena yeah, I did. Rocket? I did. You did? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I and, did and, and I acknowledge that there's two of them that use the Caster 120, so they, they're okay. sort of the same family. All right. Well, well then, then, <laughs> then you're better than Watson. Uh, I, I had the privilege... Uh, number of years ago and being at one of the Berkshire Hathaway annual meetings when Warren Buffett was uh, very unusually apologetic because he had uh, made a big bet on airline stocks and uh, had lost a lot of money for the company. And he had a quote then that I've, I've often um, used and he said, uh, you know, in the history of airlines, um, collectively, all the companies together haven't made any money. As a matter of fact, they've, uh, they've burned billions of, uh, of dollars in uh, investor capital, and, and part of it was ours. He said, if I'd have been at Kitty Hawk on the day that thing was launched, I'd have taken a bazooka to it. <laughs> So uh, I was uh, struck earlier by the, uh, the comments that, uh, you know, this isn't the first time we've done commercial. There were billions of dollars invested uh, by private companies before, uh, in, on EELV, on the X-33. Of course, now there's money uh, invested in Falcon, and nobody's yet made any money. And uh, I want to ask you a question as an investor, uh, just, like, or just, like, uh, just like Warren Buffett uh, was looking at investing our money. I want to think about uh, how we might invest in this business. I just Googled um, the Carpet GM Merrill Lynch uh, World Wealth Report, and according to Merrill Lynch, there are 17 million people worldwide who have $1 million in uh, uh, investable assets, 170,000 who have uh, uh, 30 million worldwide in investable assets, 17,000 people worldwide who have $100 million in net assets. So if you assume that you had you know, pretty good market penetration, uh, at today's prices, you might have a market for um, 1,700 uh, passengers in the space. So I have two questions for you. Is there some market for this other than government and tourism? And the second question that would make me interested as an investor in investing in, in this is, what is the, uh, what price point do you have to get commercial space flight to before you actually have a market and how big is it? Yeah, those are, uh, those are ultimately very impossible questions to answer and they change over time, I believe. The only uh, comprehensive professional study that was done on those sorts of questions was the Futron Market Study that was done in 2002. I encourage you to read that. I was heavily involved in that. Um, and we did uh, exactly what you said. We started with the addressable market, how many people can afford it. We asked uh, uh, on the order of 400 millionaires uh, whether they would go and what their risk prof profile was and how much they'd be willing to pay. Um, but that has now, it's almost a decade old, things change. Um, and ultimately it depends on a lot of unknowns. How much is the price? of this service, how much did it cost to develop, how much of your own money do you need to get back. Uh, it's those, those are ultimately 
not questions you can answer in the abstract. It doesn't exist for, it's not the same number for every company. It's specific, every business case is specific to the specific company. I'll give you a great example, Cots Cargo, Orbital Sciences, they came forward with the tour, uh, Taurus 2 vehicle. Um, that made sense for their business because they had a, a, a commercial communication satellite that fit into that range and they wanted an all orbital system that could do the launch vehicle and the spacecraft all at once, geo, comsats to orbit, and the Taurus 2 could also do this COTS mission. You couldn't do that business case generically. The government could not have created that business case and said that closes, but yet for that company, that made sense. So when people ask me about the business case for commercial crew, I ultimately don't spend a lot of time thinking about that. That will be the responsibility of the private sector to close their business case. We, NASA, are coming forward with technical and financial assistance. Uh, we believe we will be a big investor. The other question you had is, you know, how, is this a good bet for, for, the, for the government? Should we be investing? And that's a very good analogy. We do see ourselves as investing in these systems. Uh, great question. What's the alternative? The alternative is we do it the old way where we are the, the owner, the operator, and the payee. Every cost estimate that we have done under that traditional uh, approach says three to four times the amount that we're talking about for commercial crew. So I think it's a very good investment on the part of the taxpayer, and we should be the poster child of deficit reduction and government reduction in spending, because we are taking content off the government rolls, giving it to the private sector, and doing it for a fraction of the cost of what we would do it for the government uh, if it was a government program. So, so I believe it is, a, it is a very good investment on the part of the taxpayer. Um, we're getting a bargain if we are successful. I do not want to minimize the uh, challenges associated with commercial crew. There are a lot of challenges and I'm not assuming that we are going to be successful. But if successful, I think it's a good bet and a lot of potential upside for the nation, for NASA, for the entire world. Uh, I'm not, I know that sounds dramatic, uh, but I believe that once we push uh, the in economic interests and the private sector interests out to low Earth orbit, there will be no turning back. We have seen how tenuous our human spaceflight programs can be. Uh, they cannot be on the whims of partisan concerns and politics, but once we get economic interests at the table to low Earth orbit, there will be no turning back and we will incrementally then proceed out into the solar system. That's what I think this is ultimately about. Well, folks, uh, these are all launch people. As those of you who've ever been in launch, there is an opening time for a window and there's a closing time for a window. And the window is closed. Thank you for your attention. Please thank the panel.